Jackie uh, is able to come here today. And, uh, welcome to warm and uh, nice Kentucky. And I heard that uh, Jackie was you here before. You have never been here before Kentucky. You probably never seen this wonderful uh, horse farm. Okay. So this is a good time to come here to see it. Uh, Jackie actually that uh, and they got uh, her BS uh, in uh, Cooper Union. And uh, later on, I got a PhD at, uh, in uh, Princeton University. And uh, she also was a postdoc in Germany for one year. And uh, her research pretty much concentrated on the uh, nanotechnology, uh, nanocrystalline material, and uh, some other subjects also. And uh, Professor Ying got uh, numerous and uh, award and, uh, for her research including the American uh, Ceramic Society uh, Ross C. Purley Award for the most valuable contribution to ceramic te technical literature in 1993, and uh, Office of the Navy Research Young Investigate Award, National Science uh, Foundation Young Investigate, uh, Young <coughs> Investigate uh, Award, and the Camille, Camille Drafts Teacher Scholar Award, and the Loyal Academy of Engineering ICR Faculty Fellowship, American Chemical Society Faculty Fellowship Awards in Solid State Chemistry, and uh, University of Notre Dame uh, Ernest Seeley Lectureship, and uh, some other awards. And today she will talk about uh, uh, nanostructure processing of advanced catalytic materials. And uh, Professor Yu, welcome. Thank you. So good afternoon, so great pleasure to be here. I'd like to thank uh, XC uh, for this opportunity to speak to you on nanostructure processing of advanced catalytic materials. So the overall interest of my research is in the area of nanostructure processing, which can be used um, to design various advanced materials. And here I'll focus on catalysts, uh, where we're interested in this material because of their very high surface volume ratio. Um, also, they give rise to homogeneous nanocomposite systems. Steve, maybe before we break the whole time, if you could just let us turn the light on the couch. I don't see. That's probably the best way is just to turn off the lights, I guess. Yeah, turn the light on the couch. You turn off the lights. Um, they also give rise to homogeneous nanocomposite systems so that you can obtain unique chemical and electronic synergistic effects so that uh, you can obtain uh, very unusual catalytic properties. Lastly, these materials also give rise to unusual surface reactivity and defect chemistry. In particular, there are two classes of nanostructure materials that we're interested in. The first one being what we call nanocrystalline materials whereby you have crystallized sizes on the order of 10 nanometers. And here you have a lot of unique size-dependent properties such as common confinement effects. And when you compact these uh, nanocrystals together, what you will find is that you have a very high volume fraction of grain boundaries. And this can further be engineered through doping and a very high defect concentration to manipulate the chemical electronic uh, structure. Lastly, uh, we are also interested in nanoporous materials here we're dealing with materials with a very high pore volume so that you can greatly enhance activity through a very high surface area. And secondly, we're interested also in tailoring of uh, porous structures that are well defined so that you can control uh, size and shape selectivity. So let me start by describing the recent advances in nanoporous materials, which are typically made with a very broad pore size distribution in the mesoporous regime until the mobile scientists developed this uh, supramolecular templating approach that created well-defined mesoporous silicates, which they call MCM41. So in this approach, basically, what you start out with is a surfactant micelle, which has hydrophilic head group and a hydrophobic core. 
When you do this at a high enough concentration for the mice cells, you can obtain basically liquid crystalline mesial structures, and the silicates can be deposited around these uh, micellar rods through charge interaction. So the silicates are negatively charged, and you can use a cationic peg groups for the surfactants. Through condensation of these silicates, basically you can then obtain a material, but by upon calcination, you remove all the surfactant micelles to leave behind just the cylindrical pores of uh, silicates that are hexagonally packed. They call this MCM41 materials. And they are very exciting because they have very high surface area. And in addition, the pores can be very well defined and uniform in size. This is basically controlled by the surfactant chain length. For example, if you have a carbon pen, you get a 20 Armstrong pores that are hexagonally packed. If you go to carbon 16, you'll get a 40 Armstrong pores. And if you introduce a swelling agent, such as mesetylate, which will go into the hydrophobic pores of this micelle, you will further expand the micelle to give you pores as big as 65 or 100 Armstrong. So various research groups have looked at this approach for making pure silica or dope silicate compositions. So the current state of the art for well-defined nanoporous material includes the zeolites, which are aluminosilicates and phosphates with micropores of less than 50 Armstrongs. And now you also have this MCM41, which are aluminosilicates with pores in the range of uh, 20 to 100 Armstrong. The target that we have basically is to try to achieve compositional flexibility with well-defined pore structures. In particular, my research group is interested in making transition metal oxide mesoporous materials. As you know, transition metal oxides are very useful for a wide variety of catalytic and gas absorption applications, okay. um, such as uh, in reactions such as uh, partial oxidation, NOx decomposition or photocatalysis. The catalytic activity of those reactions can be greatly improved if you can obtain a material with much higher surface area. There are also reactions that involve transition metal sites and very large substrates, such as hydrodesulfurization, polymerization, chiral-based asymmetric catalysis. All those reactions will benefit from having a very large mesoporous structures. However, there's a great deal of problem in terms of uh, trying to extend the micelle template synthesis that was developed by the mobile scientists to compositions beyond the silicon. For example, uh, we have found that uh, various groups have tried to use this matching charge density distribution between the surfactant head groups and the inorganic precursors. And frequently, they have a lot of difficulty in using that to obtain the appropriate micelle inorganic interaction to achieve self-assembly. <coughs> in a couple of cases where people have claimed that they were able to make non-aluminosilicate-based diesel structures, as soon as they remove the surfactant, that mesial structure would collapse. So they were not able to obtain well-defined materials uh, of compositions other than the silicates. So when we started working in this area, we tried to make hexagonally packed mesoporous transition metal oxides, first by starting out with cationic surfactants, similar to the, the ones developed by the mobile side. So these surfactants were introduced to the various uh, transition metal salts <coughs> during the basic precipitation. And what we found is that they simply lead to regular type of oxides with no special mesial structure. If you use various uh, metal oxides introduce surfactants during their hydrothermal treatment, what you will find is that these oxides do not undergo any uh, special mesial structure formation. So basically, transition metal salts and oxides are fairly inner. They don't undergo this kind of supramolecular templating in the presence of surfactants. Now, if you use a very reactive precursor, on the other hand, such as metal oxides, what will happen is under the condition where you're trying to achieve charge match interaction, the reaction of hydrolysis and condensation of this salt gel type of precursor will occur so rapidly that you end up with amorphous gel. In other words, it doesn't have a chance to undergo self-assembly. 
So what we have learned from this unsuccessful initial attempt is that we should stay with this reactive precursors, but try to work on the conditions where self-assembly can occur by slowing down the hydrolysis reaction. We did this by working at a, a pH of around five. At the pH of five, basically hydrolysis and condensation rates of this metal oxides are fairly slow. Okay. And the surface will develop a positively charged species for the inorganic species. So for charge matching interaction, we really should be using an anionic surfactant instead of a cationic surfactant. Now through the process of hydrolysis and condensation, the surface charge will basically have a different distribution over time. So it is very difficult to maintain and keep the same mesal structure throughout the reaction. And this is where we decide to use a very different type of approach, which we call ligand interaction, that directly binds the surfactant to the metallic precursor, so that we can ensure the strong interaction throughout the self-assembly process and hydrolysis and condensation. So let me focus on the second method, which we call the ligand-assisted templating approach. So if you want to make a niobium oxide molecular sieve, you can start out with niobium atoxide precursor. Okay. And from chemistry, we know that niobium and nitrogen can form a very strong covalent bond. So the surfactant heck that we use is an amine surfactant. So you allow these two species to interact in the absence of water. So they form a strong bond. Now you have the inorganic precursor ligated to a surfactant that has a hydrophobic uh, tail. Now when you introduce a water, you will then undergo self-assembly. Okay. So this approach is important in that it provides a rational basis for designing the molecular precursors for tailoring this nanoporous structures. By changing the template size, we can control the pore dimension. Okay. And by using this ligand interaction, it is possible not only to apply supramolecular templating to mesoporous materials, but also to microporous materials. And secondly, the surfactant to metal interaction is important. It will allow you to produce different kinds of mesal structures. Lastly, the nature of inorganic precursor is also critical. When you use a molecular precursor, what you usually end up with is amorphous force pore walls. Okay? So I'll show later that when we use a nanocrystalline precursor, you can obtain a pore structure that is crystalline. So our first example of the synthesis of this transition metal oxide molecular sieve is uh, this niobium oxide tech molecular sieve, which we call TMS1. This is a mesoporous material that was synthesized by a tetradesyl amine using a niobium atoxide precursor. You can see the pores are basically about 27 Armstrong in dimension and hexagonally packed cylindrical pores. The pore walls are about 8 Armstrong in thickness. Similarly, we can extend this kind of synthesis to short chain templates, such as hexoamine, to obtain a microporous material, which again is hexagonally packed, but there's some beam damage when we took this uh, PEM picture. So you see, by this approach, we can systematically synthesize materials with pores varying from 5 Armstrong all the way to 100 Armstrong. And we can also extend beyond this niobium oxide composition to other transition metal oxide material, such as titanium, tantalum, zirconium, all with very high surface areas. And lastly, we can control the mesial structure by the surfactant to metal ratio, which allows us to manipulate the liquid crystalline phases that one can achieve. We can obtain a two-dimensional hexagonal structure shown here, or a three-dimensional hexagonal structure in the form of P63 MMC a layer structure or a cubic diesel basis. So we have recently gone beyond this kind of uh, just the first example of transition metal oxide systems to nanocomposite systems. In particular, we're interested in zirconia-based nanocomposites. Uh, zirconia, as you know, are of great catalytic interest because they have a high degree of uh, flexibility in terms of tailoring of surface facility. For example, you can use a pure zirconia for a weak 
acidic uh, catalyst using, for example, dehydration. If you have phosphated meconium, you can do some cis trans or double bond like summarization. If you have a sulfated or tungstated zirconia, now you can do something that requires strong acidity, such as scatter summarization, alkylation, or cracking. However, the way that uh, these zirconia based materials are conventionally produced, they have very little uh, microstructural control, and they typically made with fairly low surface area. And so, what we hope to do is to use a supramolecular templating approach to make porous zirconia based catalysts that has very high surface area and well-defined pore structure. Now, as you know, for catalytic application, it's important for the solid acid catalyst to be crystalline in nature. Otherwise, there will be a distribution of bond angles and length, and that will give rise also to a great deal of uh, distribution in the acid strength. That will lead to very poor selectivity. So our goal here is not only to make a well-defined uh, mesoporous material, but to make something that has crystallinity. So we decided to do this by starting out with a crystalline precursor, such as a nanocrystalline zirconia colloid. If we want to make a tungstate <coughs> zirconia, we can use something like ammonia metal tungstate as a precursor. So the goal here is to work under a pH that is below the point of zero charge. In that case, the surface charge for the zirconia particles is positive, and it will be charge balanced by the metatown state anions. Now this colloidal zirconia precursors will be on the order of one to five nanometer, depending on what you've selected. So since the precursor is really pretty big, you will want to use a fairly large supramolecular template. So we decided to use a tri-block hole polymer instead of a surfactant as a supramolecular. This is a P123 micelle, which has a two blocks of a polyethylene oxides at the two ends, which are hydrophilic, and the center is a hydrophobic block of polypropylene oxide. So under a low pH, this again will assume a positively charged uh, surface species, and this will do the charge balance between the three components. Okay. So the tungsten species will basically glue the zirconium particles and it will allow the tungsten species to have a very high dispersion over zirconia without forming a separate phase. So after you uh, calcine the material to burn out this uh, tri-block polymer template, what you end up with is a mesoporous material shown here. The pores are not hexagonally packed and well-ordered as in the case I showed you earlier because now the template and the uh, inorganic precursors are not quite ordered in the same way. Okay? And the inorganic precursors are very large. But we see that what we can achieve is a very high surface area even after calcination of 600 degrees Celsius for tungstate zirconia. And the pore size distribution is fairly narrow, centered about 4.4 nanometers. Besides having this uh, high surface area, we were also able to achieve a framework that is crystalline for the first time by this supramolecular template approach. So if you zoom in with high resolution electron microscopy, you will realize that these four walls are made up of these five nanometer zirconium colloid particles that were used as a precursor. So whatever <laughs> particle sizes that you use in the zirconium colloid is what will be the thickness of the four walls. So in this case, we have cubic phase zirconium. So this material, in the synthesized form and after calcination to 600 degrees Celsius, show one peak that indicates its mesial structure. And when you calcine it above 700 degrees Celsius, the mesial structure will be lost. So the material is stable up to 700 degrees Celsius, which is a very high temperature, um, without forming any uh, specific zirconia or tungsten phases. It is only when you calcine to a high temperature that you see the tetragonal zirconia or the tungstate species. Now instead of using the zirconia colloid, we can also use a molecular precursor such as a zirconia uh, nitrate salt shown here. If you use a molecular precursor, what you will find is that you can get a nice hexagonally packed cylindrical pore structure. 
In this case, because the inorganic precursor are much smaller, the pore wall thickness is also much smaller, and it is amorphous instead of crystalline. And because of that, the material is stable only up to about 400 degrees Celsius. In this picture, we show the meso structure after calcination at 250 degrees Celsius, which still maintain the meso structure. If you go beyond 400 degrees Celsius, such as 600 degrees Celsius, you will lose the meso structure. So basically, we see we can manipulate the inorganic precursor to obtain four walls that are crystalline or amorphous of various thickness. Okay, depending on what we introduce. And this approach can also be extended to other metal oxides. For example, we have used um, titania and alumina colloids to obtain crystalline uh, mesoporous tungstated titania and alumina. And this material all have high surface area with pore sizes of on the order of six to seven nanometers. Now, these materials were then tested for a, a solid acid catalysis, such as a iso-octane cracking reaction, which is a, a probe reaction for strong acidity. We have examined both uh, tungstate alumina and tungstate zirconia as a potential candidate for catalyzing this reaction, and compared it to the result that we obtained from USY zeolite. Okay. We see that tungstate alumina and zirconia are very stable in terms of activity over time. It doesn't undergo the deactivation or coking the way that the zeolite Y does over time. Okay? So our material is a lot more stable than a US Y zeolite for this cracking reaction. So for this first part, I wanted to show you that we have successfully synthesized a first example of stable mesoporous and microporous transition metal oxide molecular sieve. And by this supramolecular template route, by either using a ligation of organometallic precursor or direct assembly of inorganic colloids. This offers a lot of uh, exciting potential catalytic applications since you can make not only pure transition metal oxides but easily mixed metal oxide compositions. And from then, uh, you can then achieve chemical selectivity and redox capability associated with those transition metal sites. For example, niobium oxide materials, when you start synthesizing, it is a light yellow color material with niobium 5 plus oxidation state. You can actually reduce it to give you something that's greenish in color with an oxidation state of plus 4. And back and forth, you can achieve this kind of a redox capability. You can also introduce uh, nanocrystalline colloids to achieve nanocrystalline T in the pore walls and also surface acidity associated with the tungstate species. Lastly, um, we can also obtain material that is very well defined pore structure. You can make this material in the form of films and they can be filled with something like bismuth to create bismuth nanowires, which are of great interest to us as thermoelectric applications. The flexible pore size tailoring also allows us to achieve a sh potential shape and size selectivity for large molecules. And in particular, I would like to focus the next part on using this material as a support for the fixation of organometallic complexes and enzymes for fine chemicals and pharmaceutical synthesis. So one of the major applications for mesoporous material is to use them as a basis for supported metal catalysts or heterogenized catalysts for reactions involving large substrates. The key really is a catalyst support because you, you need this material to have large pores in order to facilitate diffusion of the large substrates and or fixation of large complexes without blocking the pores completely. Now the porosity is important also to achieve a high surface area and you also hope to have a composition that allow you to easily modify its surface chemistry. The material should really have a structural integrity so that you can easily recover and reduce the solid materials. The examples I'd like to describe involves the HEC reaction and asymmetric hydrogenation. In both of these two reactions, currently the industry uses a metal phosphine catalyst 
this methylphosphine catalyst are basically homogeneous catalysts. They are expensive to synthesize. They also deactivate rapidly by forming dimers. Okay? Or they will play out onto the reactor vessel walls. And lastly, as a homogeneous catalyst, they're difficult to recover and use without going through uh, separation processes shown here. So our goal really is to develop heterogeneous catalysts for those reactions so that you can prevent the deactivation of those active sites from dimerization. And you can also hope to achieve uh, easy separation and reuse of those heterogeneous catalysts by simple filtration techniques. Now for those reactions, since you're dealing with very large substrates, what you will want to have is actually a very large pore support. Okay. So instead of just using surfactants as templates, we would like to use the tri-block of polymers as templates, the polyethylene oxide and polypropylene oxide blocks for P123 that I described earlier will come in very handy. That was first combined with silicates to form what is known as SBA15 by Galen Stuckey's group at UC Santa Barbara. This materials will form spherical micelles, and when silicates are introduced, the micelles will form rod-shaped micelles, and you end up with cylindrical, hexagonally packed pores that are on the order of about six to seven nanometers. We wanted to achieve higher, uh, larger pores than SBA15, so we decided to play with the addition of oil, such as trimethylbenzene, to this whole system. When we introduce the oil to this tri-block copolymer micelle, what will happen is this micelle will remain spherical. So you will not turn into hexagonally packed uh, rod-shaped micelles. So when you introduce the silica, the silica will be templating around interacting or touching spherical micelles. And you will end up getting a foam-like structure after you burn out the, uh, the organics. This foam-like structure is very interesting because it's much more open than many points of entry rather than a two-point entry of a cylinder, uh, cylindrical type of pores. It also has a much larger pore opening on the order of 35 nanometers instead of a seven nanometers here. And lastly, we can change this oil to polymer ratio. As we increase it further, we will get this fishnet type of structure. Okay, and you will form a lot of little ball-like structures which, when magnified, show you that it has a structure that reminds you of fullery, except the pore sizes are much bigger on the order of 30 to 75 nanometers. So we're particularly interested in this type of foam-like structure as a support for fine chemical and pharmaceutical synthesis. So for example, if you have, want to examine a reaction like heck catalysis, which is a very uh, powerful, flexible tool for synthetic chemistry in that it involves a coupling of an aryl halide with an olefin to form a large uh, molecule. <coughs> and these molecules are frequently used by pharmaceutical companies like Merck okay, to produce hormones and enzyme inhibitors. Now the most active catalysts for this type of reaction that exists are homogeneous palladium complexes shown here. What we would like to do is to develop heterogeneous catalysts for this reaction. And the first approach that we decided to take is to make very, nice, very well dispersed palladium classes. So what we want to do is to graft on organometallic complexes, okay, and then reduce it to form discrete palladium clusters on the surface of an ultra-large pore support. We can do this by what we call vapor grafting method which is really a chemical vapor deposition approach. Okay. So you make use of a condensation bridge. On one arm of the condensation bridge, you immerse it in an oil bath at about 80 degrees Celsius. You will evaporate a palladium complex, such as a palladium allyl cyclopentadienyl species, and it will be deposited onto the mesoporous silica surface by attaching to the cyanidal groups on the surface of this mesoporous pore. Then basically you can reuse the material in the presence of hydrogen, and this will then give you a palladium metal that are highly dispersed on the surf surface of a support site, SBA15 or mesoporous silica form. 
any excess material, the important point is to pull it through onto the other end of the condensation bridge so that it doesn't produce large clusters in our support. So for this system, we were able to achieve very high palladium dispersion and we have examined various different kinds of support to see the effect of pore structure on the kinetics of this reaction. So for example, we have grafted palladium on SBA15, which has 70 unstrong cylindrical pores, the mesoporous foam, which has 310 unstrong pore sizes, and silica gel, which has an average pore size of 71 unstrong. And this material available commercially on strength has a very wide pore size distribution. So you not only have this large missile pores, frequently you also have bottlenecks in the form of micro pores. But in all cases, we were able to introduce a very high content of palladium while achieving a very high dispersion. This is three times higher dispersion than what you can achieve uh, by the best impregnation methods. So with this kind of results, we can then go on to compare the three different vapor graph and catalyst for a reaction of hectopolysis involving bromo or sanofino with angular actor. This was a reaction that took place at 160 degrees Celsius. And what we see is that uh, the effect of the pore size and pore structure is dramatic. You have a mesoporous foam shown in blue. You have very fast kinetics within less than 20 minutes. You have 100% conversion, giving a turnover number of 5,000 per cycle. If you have a mesoporous SBA15, which has smaller pores and cylindrical pores, the reaction is lower. If you have a silica gel, which has a wide pore size distribution, the reaction is even more sluggish. But in all three cases, you can achieve very high dispersion, and the catalyst can be easily recovered and used. Okay, so we have developed a very powerful heterogeneous catalyst this reaction. The second approach to making heterogeneous catalysts involves the fixation of palladium phosphine complexes onto this ultra-large pore support. Okay. So there are many different ways of, that we can introduce this palladium complex, but the key is to be able to fixate it in such a way that it doesn't leach off. Okay. So this approach I described here is a step-by-step -step synthesis within this pore structure, which can be SBA15 or mesoporous pore. The key is that the pore size is big enough. If you use MCM41, you will not be able to introduce this large complex okay, into the pore structure because there's not enough room. Okay. So what we do is we make use of the fact that on the silica surface of, say, SBA15, there's a lot of silent pores. Then if you introduce a, a toxic silane Person, this epoxy groups will react with the silent groups, and whatever organic functional groups will basically be introduced as a linker for placing phosphine groups. And lastly, you can place the palladium complex on there. So now you have built a palladium phosphine complex within the ultra large pore SBA15. We then use this uh, catalyst for much more challenging head reaction that involves bromo banding and angular aggregate. It's much more challenging because now you don't have that acetophenol group. Okay, so this is a, a non-activated um, aryl halide. For this reaction, it's very challenging in that only homogeneous catalysts are known to catalyze this reaction. There are no good heterogeneous catalysts. So the best homogeneous catalyst is this complex shown here by Hermann's group in uh, Munich. And at 140 degrees Celsius, it can achieve a turnover number of about 96. For our catalyst, which involves the building of an amine linker and then the phosphine ligand into the SBA15, what we can do is we can operate actually at a lower temperature and get five times higher turnover numbers than the best homogeneous catalyst. So now we have a superior catalyst in terms of activity, and it is heterogeneous catalyst so that you can easily recover it. The second reaction I'd like to describe is uh, asymmetric hydrogenation. Here I want to see, I want to show you that what we can also do with this mesoporous material is apply the kind of concept that we described 
to chiral organometallic complexes. So asymmetric hydrogenation briefly is a hydrogenation of prochiral molecule to form a very specific enantiomer. Okay? And the EE value is described as such. And asymmetric hydrogenation is one of the most uh, popular uh, asymmetric reactions and it is used in production of various fine chemicals and pharmaceuticals. For example, naproxen, which is an anti-inflammatory drug, is produced in huge quantities in annual sales, and involves one of the steps of the synthesis is an asymmetric hydrogenation. Now for asymmetric hydrogenation, one of the most popular catalysts is ruthenium binac. Okay. Now ruthenium binac basically has the structure that our circle basically has and this binary. And this BF4 is used to balance the system. So what we have decided to do is to create a homogeneous catalyst for this system first that has a ligand that binds a ruthenium to an isonitrile. This isonitrile group is important because it links the ruthenium to the silicon system which has a toxic group. And this toxic group basically can be used to react with the cytosol species on the silicon support so that you can fixate it, in this case, for example, okay, on the silicon surface. So this is our homogeneous counterpart for our heterogeneous ruthenium binary catalysts. Now this ligand that you use is critical. We have picked an isonitrile group because it has a very strong binding interaction so that over time, the ruthenium will not leach off from the ligand. Okay. Secondly, uh, it's also electron withdrawing, so that it will give the ruthenium a greater activity from a stronger Lewis acidity. So with these two systems, we then compare the activity in a reaction that involves a metal to a acetaminophen. Okay. So we use a high pressure reactor and methanol is used as a solvent at high hydrogen pressure at 60 degrees Celsius. Conversion and EE values are monitored by a gas cooler. So for this reaction, what is critical is to see whether fixation of the homogeneous complex onto the silica support will change the EE value and how would it affect the activity. We show here that after fixation of the homogeneous complex, to get a heterogeneous catalyst, the E values remain the same. Okay, this is great news. And in addition, we see that for this system, we can achieve much higher activity using a heterogeneous catalyst. We believe this may be due to two reasons. One is you have a higher concentration of the substrates within this porous support, okay, so that you can achieve a faster kinetics. The second thing it may have to do with the fact that the heterogeneous catalyst prevented the activation of the catalytic complex by fixating it and not allowing any dynamization. So for this reaction, we achieve a high E value of about 65. For the given substrate, this is a very high value. And the second thing is we decided to see whether we can easily recover and reuse the heterogeneous catalyst. And indeed, we could without losing really uh, much of the activity or changing the selectivity of the system. So this is a very robust catalyst that you can reuse easily. So for the second part, what I've shown you is that we can synthesize silicate forms as catalyst support, and they have this large open pore structures, and they're templated by polymer oil microemulsions. You can then vapor grab the metallic complexes within this porous silica to obtain discrete palladium uh, sites for carbon-carbon coupling reaction. And we show that definitely the support is very important. The fastest rates will be achieving supports that have an ultra-large force. And this is not surprising because of a facilitated transfer. And secondly, we can bind metal phosphine complexes onto mesoporous silica. And this will give rise to superior activity for heck reaction of non-activated aerogelides compared to the vast homogeneous catalyst. It also gives rise to higher activity for asymmetric hydrogenation than homogeneous catalysts with basically a retention of the E values that you have gathered in the 
homogeneous complex. Lastly, we found that in all our heterogeneous catalysts, we can easily recover and reuse them without any loss in activity or selectivity. So the last part I'd like to just briefly describe what we're doing with a nanocomposite catalyst in the form of nanocrystalline materials. So nanocrystal materials, people know, have very high surface area. But you will also think because of its high surface area, it has a very high driving force to sink through it due to the high surface free energy. What I want to illustrate here is that with careful processing and the right selection of crystal structure, it is possible to actually use this nanocrystalline catalyst for high temperature applications such as catalytic combustion of methane. Now we're interested in catalytic combustion of methane because um, in this country we have lots of natural gas. Okay, and when you are able to burn this natural gas, you can obtain a, a much higher heat content per gram of CO2 than is emitted. So you could achieve basically uh, a lower global warming impact by reducing the amount of CO2 that is emitted when you burn this natural gases. Now the problem with natural gas is that a big portion of that is methane, and it doesn't have any carbon-carbon bonds. So you require very high temperatures, more than 1,300 degrees Celsius to burn them. Okay? And by that temperature, all the oxygen, nitrogen in the air feed stream will have reacted to form NOx, which is another terrible problem. So this is why catalytic processes are being examined in combustion. And catalytic combustion basically can allow you to reduce the flame temperatures so that you can prevent the production of NOx. Secondly, it can also allow you to combust ultra lean mixtures, meaning at a very high end of fuel ratios, okay, so that you can completely burn all the hydrocarbons. Lastly, you, catalytic combustion has to be applied at fairly high temperatures. Okay, so the catalyst involved has to be stable to 1300 degrees Celsius. This is because in order to have very high efficiency in energy generation, you have to make use of high temperatures to achieve that kind of carbon efficiency. So if you look at the existing combustion catalysts, okay, people have examined supported noble metals like palladium oxide, or platinum, or aluminum. These are very active at low temperature. They will kick off about 350 to 400 degrees Celsius. But the problem is they will start sintering and losing activity above 750 degrees Celsius. So they are not going to be able to be used at Type of temperatures that we're going to expose them to catalytic combustion. And secondly, we also looked at the uh, base metal oxides, and these materials are not as active. They require more than 700 degrees Celsius of light off, and again, they start losing surface area above 800 degrees Celsius. So, this has brought us to complex oxides such as barium hexaluminate or BHA. These materials, by the conventional process, you could retain up to 15 square meters per gram of surface area at 1300 degrees Celsius, which is very high for that temperature. And this is because the material um, will have some activity from a high oxygen uptake or conductivity. So this material is of great deal interest, and the reason is really because it has a complex crystal structure which is a mixed P63 MMC type of structure. So it's like a spinel-like structure. And the crystal growth is highly anisotropic and suppressed, especially in the C direction, where the unicell parameter is very large. So what this means is that if you could crystallize the material, you can prevent grain growth. Unfortunately, the way that conventional synthesis are involved, where you have salt gel or chemical precipitation, they make use of a Aluminum and barium precursors, they are very different in terms of reactivity. So when you try to mix them together, they will form separate phases. Then you require a very high temperature solid state reaction to crystallize them at temperatures of about 1300 degrees Celsius. Okay? So by that temperature, you will have undergo a lot of grain growth and loss of surface area. So your surface area will drop down to at most 15 square meters. And because surface area is so low, you can only kick off the reaction at about 720 degrees Celsius. 
Our goal is to use this material which has very high thermal resistance and make it in such a way that it will be active at temperatures as low as about 400 degrees Celsius where they can compete even with normal metal cows but are superior to thermal resistance. So to do that, we decided to try to synthesize nanostructure BHA. Here we want to achieve very high surface area BHA with enhanced activity and stability. So the first thing we had to do is to achieve this material with molecular level chemical homogeneity. Okay? Then you should have a chance to promote crystallization at much lower temperature and prevent subsequent grain growth or loss of surface area. We can also try to make this material as non-agglomerated particles of uniform size and morphology so that it can give rise to very high surface area and sintering resistance. Lastly, it's uh, important to realize that BHA on its own is not going to get you to the kind of low temperature activity that is desired. People have tried to introduce dopants, but that doesn't give a major improvement. What we will show you is we'll try to control the surface dispersion of various transition metal and rare earth oxides to change the low temperature activity. And the approach I'd like to describe that we have developed is called a reverse microemotion mediated synthesis. Now this reverse microemotion mediated synthesis has been used to produce quantum dots of two six semiconductors. But they typically use surfactants like AOT, okay, and those surfactants frequently contain either phosphorus or sulfur species that will contaminate our material. So what we have developed here is actually a very different surfactant package that involve uh, a toxylated alcohols. So they can be burned off cleanly. And more importantly, they will allow us to have very high content of water so that we can manipulate the, force, uh, the particle sizes and morphology. So the key here is really to develop aqueous nanometer sized domain in a continuous oil phase like isooctane. So the reaction of salt gel reaction that involves barium alumina oxide will only occur in this aqueous domain. So hydrolysis and condensation may actually only occur in this aqueous domain. So the domain size and morphology will determine the particle size of the water. Now the important part about this approach is that in conventional salt gel processing, you have barium aluminum, which has very different hydrolysis rates. So they form separate phases. In our reaction, the rate limiting step is not the hydrolysis of one of the species but the diffusion of these precursors through the oil phase into the aqueous domain. Okay. And because these alkoxides can be obtained with similar diffusion coefficient within the oil phase, now we have a simultaneous diffusion and reaction within this aqueous domain, so you can make a much more homogeneous system. So after this control hydrolysis, you can age the material recover these particles, remove the surfactants, and calcium to crystallize this material. Let me just describe one of the many interesting uh, synthesis parameters in this type of approach, uh, which is uh, emulsion composition. If you have one way to send water in this reverse microemulsion, when you start introducing the uh, alkoxide precursor, it will come off from this reverse micelle phase and you end up with a porous gel. It has small microporous uh, structure, but this microporous will collapse <coughs> by 700 degrees Celsius. If you have about 15 wave percent of water, then you get a nice discrete particles from the nicely uh, dispersed aqueous and the size domains that are spherical. So you end up with BHA particles on the order of 10 nanometers. Okay? This is the most highest uh, surface area. If you have higher content of water, you'll have some percolation effect, and you get a distribution of uh, spherical and elongated particles, which have lower surface area. So using the spherical particles, we can obtain very high surface area, about 470 after calcination and 500 degrees Celsius. The surface area decreases steadily with temperature, but even at 1,300 degrees Celsius, you can achieve more than 100 square meters per gram of surface area. Okay. This is really quite remarkable at such a high temperature. 
is an order of magnitude increase from the conventional synthesis. And the reason is really because we were able to start with very small particle size, about 10 nanometers, and we were able to crystallize the material at a low temperature of 1100 degrees Celsius compared to 1300 degrees Celsius required by the conventional synthesis. And because of the chemical homogeneity that we can achieve by our synthesis. So at 1100 degrees Celsius, you see the particle size will increase due to the heat release associated with crystallization, 30 nanometers. Thereafter, the grain size basically is kept at this very fine uh, 30 nanometers. Okay. So this is amazing because usually by 1300 degrees Celsius, you will have formed particles that are like several hundred of nanometers. So to illustrate this further, we have done TEM studies. You see calcining at 800 degrees Celsius gives you a loosely agglomerated particle of about 10 nanometer dimension. Calcining at 1300 degrees Celsius will give you small particles of 30 nanometers that are beginning to form some sintering between them, but you can still get over 100 square meters per gram surface area from them. And they are definitely well crystallized. So with that, we see that we proceed with a uh, mapping conversion. In the ultralink mixture of white percent mapping air at a high space velocity, if you have a regular soldier derived material, the reaction will kick off at about 710 degrees Celsius. If you have a reverse microemulsion synthesized PHA, it is more active, it will kick off reaction at 600 degrees Celsius. In addition, it has very high uh, high temperature stability. They are stable in the presence of high temperatures and high water content. Now, our goal really, as I mentioned to you, is to bring this light off behavior down to 400 degrees Celsius. If you do that, you will have a catalyst as competitive as a noble metal catalyst, and at the same time, hopefully, you will be more stable. So we decided to do this not by doping, because doping can only improve things slightly, but by introducing surface clusters or dispersions okay, of things like transition metal oxides or rare earth oxides, which are known to be great redox catalysts. Okay. So for example, I show here introducing cerium oxide on this BHA. Okay. So the key here is now using this BHA particle, which we know are highly stable and maintains a high surface area. We use that as a support for the generation of the nanocomposite. So what you will do is, you will introduce a cerium nitrate salt to the BHA nanoparticle while it is aging in a reverse microemulsion. So the cerium nitrate salt will, dis will diffuse and you will only get deposited within this aqueous domain, which already contains a BHA particle. So it has to go onto this BHA particles and decorate it with very high dispersion. Okay, many of you know that cerium oxide can be made with very small grain size. That, that is well known in palaces, okay? But the problem is, if you don't put it on appropriate support, cerium oxide will start undergoing grain growth by 700 degrees Celsius to more than 100 nanometers. Where else, in our case, you see the cerium oxide grain size will start off with about 6 nanometers, okay? And at 30 degrees Celsius, it may be a grain size that's only 20 nanometers. So you may tiny disperse of this nanocrystal BHA particles. So th this is illustrated here. At 800 degrees Celsius, cereal will have undergo grain growth to more than 100 nanometers in most cases with all existing support. In our case, you see the particles are about on the order of 10 nanometers for the BHA. But when you zoom in with high resolution electron microscopy, you see patches of serum oxide that is fringes on the order of about five to six nanometers. So we remain highly dispersed and decorated on this BHA particle. Okay. So now we have created a very active nanocomposite based on this thermally stable BHA nanoparticles synthesized by reverse microemulsion. So now the real proof of the concept comes with, uh, again, trying to combust 1% methane air at high space velocity. So, soil gel BHA kicks out about 710 degrees Celsius. 
Nano BHA kicks out about 600 degree Celsius. If you have ceria or manganese BHA produced by the method I just described, will kick off the reaction at 410 or 390 degrees Celsius. So these are very low temperatures. They are competitive to palladium oxide or platinum oxide in terms of low temperature light off activity. And on the, same, on the other hand, they are superior in terms of their high temperature stability. They can sustain the activity well around 1100 degrees Celsius. Okay? So there's no hysteresis for these two material during heating and cooling high temperatures. <coughs> so what we have now is a material that has a very broad temperature range of operation. So I hope to have given you an example where we have created very fine nanoparticles with compositional homogeneity at a molecular level using a reverse microemulsion synthesis. And the material ends up having a BHA composition with very high surface area and enhanced catalytic activity. And the most important part is to use this as a platform to create synergism between ceria and BHA, for example, to improve the low temperature activity of the material while uh, providing a very highly stable dispersion of high temperatures. So this kind of nanocomposite design can be applied to a lot of other reactions that require multifunctionality, such as high temperature stability and uh, low temperature activity or selectivity. So in conclusion, I hope to have given you a few examples of how nanostructure processing can be used to make a catalyst with unique functionality. Uh, we can literally try to shape a nanoporous substrate structures uh, using a supramolecular technique to obtain well-defined mesoporous and microporous metal oxides of various compositions, including uh, transition metal oxides. And this allows a tailored composition, pore size, and crystallinity simultaneously. And a lot of this material, especially when they have an ultra-large pore uh, structure, can be used to graft the various nanoclusters of metals and metal oxides or fixating of uh, catalytic complexes. And these are very important, I think, for heterogeneous uh, catalysts of the next generation for fine chemical and pharmaceutical synthesis. We can also try to derive nanocrystalline systems from various synthesis uh, processes including a reverse microemulsion. And the example I give you involves making complex oxides with very high surface area to the stability. And the important part is how to introduce various different components with very high dispersion in nanocomposite design so that you can create synergistic effects that will impart uh, basically multifunctionality to your system. So these are really just new tools to try to uh, generate design materials for fine chemical synthesis, environmental catalysis, just to name some of the catalytic applications. So last but not least, let me acknowledge uh, the students and postdocs of my group working on the specific projects I've described. Um, Dave Antonelli and Palestan for synthesis of mesoporous and microporous transition metal oxides. Michael Wong for supramolecular templating of tungstate metal oxides. John Leto for the synthesis of mesoporous silicate foams, Christian Bennett for PEC catalysis, and De Jianfang for asymmetric hydrogenation, and Andre Zalo for the BHA synthesis for catalytic combustion. And we are grateful for the support of NSF and Packet Foundation. Thank you very much for the time.